This is Today's Business Leaders, actionable advice from real-world professionals. And now, here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right, on today's show, I have Mike Young. He is the founder of makeovermaster.com, and we are going to talk about entrepreneurship and all sorts of fun things around that, because Mike has a pretty interesting story that, that I can relate to. So welcome to the show, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. So uh, when did you first realize that you were an entrepreneur, Mike? You know, I think, I think looking back now, I think I've always kind of been uh, entrepreneurial. Um, I, I think I realized it and my dad, my dad was entrepreneurial, but I think he taught me a lesson early that I later came to respect, which was uh, 14 years old and he was running a steel machine shop. And so he had me waking up at 4 a.m. and hanging out with three guys that didn't speak English, uh, no English, and we were scraping metal steel parts all day for eight hours a day, 10 hours a day. Um, and I was like, man, this really sucks. He's like, yeah, you should go to school and, and figure something else out. And so, uh, so I think that was a big light bulb for me, but I, I've always been wired to like, you know, focus on kind of one mission, one objective, um, not really have a backup plan or a plan B. Mm-hmm. Um, and that creates that natural sense that this entrepreneurs crave, which is a, a continuing string of problems and obstacles coming our way, which we can solve every day. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So starting with that, when, um, w- which was wise of your dad, I'm going to do something similar for my son. Um, <laughs> but create, when their, did it... create their first job so miserable that they want to go to college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to make him work some hard jobs so he knows what I went through. But, uh, but uh, so you start there. That's awesome. You, you had to get up that early because I've done that for, as a kid too. And then w- when did you start shifting into like, selling your own products or services or when did you have your first sale or your realization of like, man, this is awesome. I can, you know, I'm going to do this entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. Right after college. I mean, I spent, I I thought I was going to be a pro baseball player. And then when I realized that wasn't going to work out, I began um, saying, okay, what am I going to do next? And like I said, I didn't have a plan B. So it was, it was like, Oh shit, what am I going to do next? Um, And I had a good friend at the time. She was in the mortgage space uh, she was doing very well for herself. It was uh, 1997. And she's like, I think you'd be great at this. You're great at networking. You're great with people. You, you know, you just need to learn the industry and some sales stuff. Yeah. Um, and I loved that even though it was a, a heavily regulated industry, you kind of, it was kind of like real estate agents and mortgage brokers. You got to kind of create your own thing, your own brand, your own uh, identity, so to speak. Um, and so right from the start, I, I felt like I was creating my own rules, even though a decade later, I realized like I was in an industry that was going to create their own rules for me. So, um, but that was, that was kind of my first taste at it was running your own practice underneath a larger organization that kind of lets you do your own thing. Yeah. That's very cool. I, I, there's a ton of value in learning that way, mm-hmm. learning entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship that way. I see too many people do what I did, which is the hard long road of like, go start an idea, no experience, no oversight, no guidance, learn everything on the job and then end up, you know, struggling from there. So it's it. And then finally figuring it out, obviously. But um, yeah, you know, I think, I think it's funny now because the, the crash of 2008, also crashed my company. We, we built it from scratch to, you know, 250 plus employees. And it was, it was complex. I was getting a lot of meetings and emails and a lot of busyness. Um, I knew I wanted something different, but the crash actually just helped speed that up. But yeah. then I still went through that same phase that you went through, which is then I, I was like, oh, I could just do this again on my own and create my own thing. And next thing I knew, I was eight and a half years in and then spent a couple hundred thousand dollars before it finally worked. Um, And so I went through that same phase after doing what I would kind of recommend a lot of people do, which is kind of have some sort of regular steady income coming in as you build your skills and your character. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you ended up doing, having a day job where you're building this on the side or did you just push forward and try to figure it out without a job? (laughs) I was, I was wildly stubborn. Um, I had one moment in, so 2008, 2009, 2010 was when I was uh, 
you know, grinding my teeth or whatever they want to say there, uh, figuring a lot of things out, learning a lot of hard lessons. And in 2010, I took a quote unquote job, which was a consulting job uh, for about six months. And I, I just had run out of money. So I was, I was like, I'm broke. I'm running out of money. I needed something to stem the tide. But I knew, I even, even when I took that job, I knew that this is just a means to an end for me. Um, and after that period of 2010, I said, because it was, it was also kind of miserable. It put me back into a mortgage office doing some consulting. And this, the ultimate straw for me, honestly, was one day I was wearing shorts and t-shirt and stuff. I didn't want to wear a suit again. And they said, hey, if you're going to come into the office, we need you to dress up and wear a suit. And like, I quit the next week. I was just like, as soon as, as soon as I got any more, somebody trying to impose rules on me, I was like, I'm out of here. Um, and, but that period was good. It kind of reinforced, I don't want to be in an office. It reinforced that I wanted to do my own thing. And from that moment on in 2010, I, I never went back to a job, even, even to the point where I've sold my car to pay my team. I've sold assets to keep alive. And so um, I just got to this place where I wasn't willing to go back and settle. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard once you, <clears throat> it's hard once you develop a skill set to go back and make an hourly wage when you know you can make what it, you can make in a month in like a day. Yeah. It's so hard. Like, cause it's I, really I just, yeah. But right before this podcast, I had a call with the client and you know, it, it just turned into a little bit of consulting and coaching on the side, which is, probably going to be more than some people make in an entire month. And, and it's great. You know, it's like, you can do that in an hour and create a, a, an income for yourself. Although I think the frustrating part is when you're starting out, everybody makes that seem so easy and they don't talk about the reality of, of the decade long journey. It took me to get to this place, you know? Um, and so I think, I think it's interesting, you know, now that I look back, it's just, uh, it's a, a road that can be a lonely road for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, now I mean, I could, there's a million things I would do differently if I could do it over again today. Yeah. But at the same token, all that adversity and obstacles and everything else built my skills and my character. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Catch that, 22. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely the, the hard, good lessons that you don't really want to repeat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's dive into that a little more though, because I think that's, um, that's a core part of kind of my message and belief and what I always share with my audience and everybody I interact with is I always say it, it only takes 10 years to become an overnight success. So keep going. Mm -hmm. And if, it, and that's exactly what you just shared of like spending, you know, uh, nearly a decade or whatever you said, the eight years or so there to figure it out at some level. Mm -hmm. If you look back on that, what do you think is your advice to somebody that's starting out that is still in the day job or is still trying to figure this out? How can they balance the bullshit that they hear of like, Oh, you can start this tomorrow and you'll be making $10,000 a month. Cause if it was that easy. We'd all be doing it yeah. um, to, Oh, this could take you a decade to get there. Like what are the phases or steps that you've seen? Cause I'm just curious. Cause I, I, it sounds like we've walked a pretty similar journey. And this isn't like, I've reflected on this, but I haven't distilled it down to the fact of like, yeah, it takes time, but maybe there's some phases in there that happen. Have you ever looked at that? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've got to, I've arrived at this place where I've not only gone through the journey, but I've, I've spent the last three or four years as I, as I wrote my book, as I ran my own event, and as I started the podcast, that was kind of this phase of, of my journey where I was reverse engineering all this stuff. So I've spent a lot of time in reflection to figure out, okay, what would I do differently? Um, Number one is I wasted a lot of time trying to figure out all the answers on my own. And I don't know if it's how I was brought up, but that guys don't share their emotions. They don't cry. They don't ask for help, you know, mm -hmm. but I was, I was essentially driving around town lost without stopping and asking for help at the gas station, you know? Yeah. And so I would say number one is clear what, what you want, what you want the end outcome to be um, clarity on, where are your skill sets, your relationship, your budget, your network? Um, where, where are you and what can you do to solve problems in the marketplace that already exist mm -hmm. that give you energy? Um, that's a, a huge mistake I see people make is they're doing something they de that doesn't actually feed their energy or give them energy. And the business is never going to take off fully 
until number one, you, you love yourself enough to allow certain things to come at you and, and accept them like sales and those types of things. Um, but number two, if you don't really love what you're doing, uh, it's never fully going to scale. And so I would say, looking back, I would get extremely clear on what I wanted. I would find somebody that's already done that. And I would hire them as a direct coach or mentor or ask for advice or work for them for free or basically surround myself as much as I could with those people that have already done what I'm trying to do. And then I would model their habits and behaviors. And, and that was the difference for me. I spent eight and a half years floundering around buying all these generic courses, you know, Russell Brunson and Marie Forleo and Don Miller and Amy Porterfield. And I bought, I literally bought all of these and all the software, but the advice was always generic advice without one-on-one -on -one direct specific help. Yeah. So I never fully tapped into what gave me the most energy. I never fully tapped into it until I hired a couple of specific mentors. And that's, that's when everything took off. It took me about 18 months to totally eclipse what I wasn't able to do in eight and a half years. Um, and so the difference with mentorship, coaching, and, and direct advice from somebody that's already done what you're trying to do is the, the difference is clarity and speed. You're, you're going to get every answer almost immediately versus having to spend four hours floundering around Google trying to find the answer. That's a good description of it. You're right. <laughs> I, I just had a coaching client come on a couple months ago and it was really cool. I haven't had a lot of clients coming to this. He's like, I want to hire you so that I can shortcut all the mistakes I'll make if I don't have you around. And it was, yeah, that's a great description of it. Cause yeah, like, I mean, you and I know it took us days or years to learn some of the things. And that's, and that's legitimately like looking back, that is the difference. If I could, if I could uh, look at the whole picture, mm -hmm. I would say that four hours searching on Google or the four hours taking a course or the four hours over here before I knew it, it was eight and a half years and $200,000. Yeah. The flip side was I hired two very high ticket mentors. Mm -hmm. um, both of them were about $30,000 for the year. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's $60,000 and it took me 18 months. And so that's like the comparison. I actually did both, which sounds really expensive. I'm kind of getting irritated with myself as I say those <laughs> numbers, but, but it's like 18 months and 60 grand versus eight and a half years and 200 grand. Yeah. No, that's definitely, definitely the way to go. And do you think there's a time that somebody should step to hiring that level of mentor or getting that? Do you think there's a season that we need to take to like fumble around or struggle a little bit? Or how do we, how do you know when it's time to do that? I think everybody's path is perfect for them. Um, when you get to the end of the day, you can kind of start to tie these things together and it's just like, Oh, I'm glad that that happened. I'm glad that this failed or whatever, but I, I have a couple of friends that they were either smart enough or lucky enough to say, I know what I want, found a mentor and things took off and they never looked back. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't have certain skills or character uh, that got built up or forged during that time that maybe, maybe I'm more mentally stable during like coronavirus times and these things that hasn't affected me too much. Um, it's definitely affected my team. It's definitely affected how we had to shift patterns and routines a little bit, but it didn't throw me off my game. And so maybe, maybe I have something that they don't because they didn't struggle. Yeah. Um, but at the same token, I, I don't think that they, like if I offered them the struggle, I don't know if they'd take it, you know, they've just had an easier journey. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if there is a perfect time. I think, I think for whatever reason, the timing always ends up perfectly. Uh, and that sounds a little bit corny or, or maybe woo woo, but um, I, I don't regret the eight and a half years now. Yeah, it, it definitely was hard and frustrating. And I had moments where I'm crying in the corner and trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, my wife's had to listen to me talk her ear off for a few years, you know, like, but you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is. Yeah. No, I, I feel the same. Like I, I lost my company in the housing market crash too and went bankrupt for a million dollars and went through a bunch of pain and adversity. And I would never trade that for a million dollars. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's not something I would want to repeat either. And so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it makes, you're totally right. Like it makes a time like this, like 
not a big deal from a business or my mindset standpoint. I don't want anybody to be sick or die or, you know, I don't want anybody to suffer, you know, obviously with, with hard times, but for me, it's really not a big deal. Like it does not affect me at any level because I've gone through a lot worse shit than this. And it's like, all right, whatever. Like, yeah, I, I, like we'll, yeah. we'll adjust and figure it out and obviously support our team and like be there for our clients and things like that. But it's not, it's not at the, it's not adversity at the level that I faced is all, is all I can well, say. And I, think, I think now to like to go back to the original question, uh, to reverse engineer this and try and simplify the game for people that might be starting out or struggling or whatever. Mm -hmm. I would say it came down to four things. Like at the end of the day, one is tremendous clarity on me and who I am and what gives me energy, what takes away from it, yeah. where my skills are. Uh, tremendous clarity on who my ideal client is and what problems they're having. Yeah. Uh, and, and tremendous clarity on how I'm going to solve those problems specifically and what we're going to charge for it. And then, and then the fourth clarity pillar that I call it is, is really understanding how human beings work. Yeah. Because the one skill that I would have taught myself sooner is, is probably copywriting um, because copywriting directly taps into human nature, psychology, sociology, and all those things. And at the end of the day, all business comes through people. And yeah. so if you can understand who you are, what problems you solve, how you solve them, and then understand how people work. Uh, you can reverse engineer your copy and your marketing. And then, then it does become as simple as a little five-step funnel, but there's a lot of work that it took me to, to get to that place. Yeah. No, I really love your focus on clarity. And I'll also say I've had a lot of people on the show and your marketing is pristine. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I, and I think, I think that's it. Like people are always asking me, well, I'm busy, but I'm, I'm busy doing things that are not important or um, I can't seem to figure out what to do next. And so all, all of those things come down to speed and speed always comes down to clarity because when you're clear that I'm going to go over here and grab this cupcake on this table and I'm going to eat it and you, you've got your mind made up, you're not, you're not walking all the way to the back of the house. You're not walking into the street. You're just going to the cupcake and eating the dang thing. And that's a terrible analogy, but that's, it's the same. It's like, get clear on what you want and what you're doing. And a lot of this stuff be, does become much, much easier on who you're talking to. Yeah. And I, I think with clarity, like personally, I've experienced this and it's something that I'm always working to improve, but I think sometimes I've had fear and I've heard, had heard other people express fear on this. If you get super clear and specific on what you're going to do, then the accountability level goes up significantly. Like it's because like if you say I'm going to go eat this cupcake, you're either yeah. going to do it or not. Yeah. But if you go like I'm going to eat some food at the buffet, there's no clarity or specificity to that, and so you can't fail. And, and if so, you, and if you do it in a way that taps into your energy too, the mm -hmm. accountability almost goes the other way, where you don't even have to hold yourself accountable. It's like we've all had those moments where you, I, I think people would call it being in flow, you know, yeah. like where you're not thinking your you're, uh, baseball analogy or sports analogy is being in the zone. You're right. like literally not thinking about the shot. It's just going in the hoop. Right. And, and when you tap into something that's in alignment with your energy and something you truly love to do, nobody has to hold me accountable to do podcasts. Nobody has to hold me accountable to, to wake up and do it. Cause I genuinely like what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and so if you can mix those two things and, and combine them together, you become really, really solid. Yeah. I think that's really wise. Cause I think that's the missing piece sometimes as people get clear on something, but maybe it's not what they should do or they want to do, or it's not tied into that energy. I've never thought about it that way. And I think that's, that's definitely wise. Well, I think one, one other thing too, and, and um, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but this is a podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the point, <laughs> uh, but, but I would, I would say, you know, as you're thinking about those things, one of the things I see a lot of times is people don't need that much encouragement. If you're a coach or a consultant or you have a product or service, people are a lot of times looking for permission to do something they really want to do. They've, for whatever reason, society or life or their spouse or their family has been telling them all the reasons something can't happen. And they've been denying themselves just to go after something they really want. So they need a little bit of permission um, so that it's an encouragement. And the number one thing I see is that people think 
that they need to be Tony Robbins before they start coaching people, where they think that they need to go through this 10 year process that you and I have gone through before they begin making real profit. Yeah. And if, have you ever seen that movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo DiCaprio? You yeah. know, the guy who essentially forged his way through life, right? Frauded his way through life. Yeah. But there's one, one part of that guy's life where he taught, um, he either taught at Harvard or Princeton, I can't remember which. Um, but he literally was, he taught a whole semester. He wasn't a teacher. And somebody was like, how did you teach that course? He said, I just read a chapter ahead. Yeah. And what happens sometimes that I see with clients is they think that they need to be 10 years ahead of somebody before they can coach them. Yeah. But that actually, that gap a lot of times is too wide. So mm -hmm. like for me to, to spend a million dollars to have Tony Robbins work with me for a day right now, I haven't built certain things in my life to be able to number one, afford that. Right. And number two, to have the connection really make sense to hang out with him for a day like that. Yeah. And so I would be much better served with a mentor that was maybe six months ahead of me. Yeah. And so that's the one thing I see people make an excuse of like, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not good enough or maybe my skills aren't there there's always somebody six months or a year behind you and to, to them, you're an expert. And so it's like, it's okay to coach somebody, even if you're only a year ahead of them. Yeah, no, that's definitely good advice. If you've done it three or four times, you're more of an expert than the person that's never done it. Like yeah, exactly. And the more you teach, the better, you know, the better your knowledge becomes when you teach in like application style, you know, settings, right? hundred percent. Yeah. So that's, I definitely agree. Um, so let's talk, let's get a little bit more specific and in detail of like what, what you do with clients and how you help them. And obviously, you know, you focus on clarity and helping them with that. Give us like some examples or some stories about what you've done and what you've worked with, with people. Sure. I, I, you know, I feel like my job and I'll, I'll put it bluntly is to kind of slap people and wake them up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only to avoid what I went through is like to stop the endless consumption of knowledge products uh, because it's it's one of two things. It's usually a self-worth issue. People feel like I need more before I can do. Um, or it's a masking issue. That's what it was for me, which is I was taking all these and that was my creative form of drugs or alcohol or Netflix, what people use to escape. Mm -hmm. I was using knowledge products. I was buying books and courses to escape the reality that my business wasn't working. I was going broke. I was frustrated. It was literally a coping mechanism. Yeah. So I feel like if I can come in and stop that and just wake people up and then give them the foundational basic tools, what I do a lot of times is I do a little bit of mindset and brand strategy work mm -hmm. and we get very clear on what we're implementing as the brand and we get the business working first. And then once the business is working, we make it pretty. And so a lot of people get that out of order. They try and focus on how does my website look and what colors and what's my logo look like. And they worry about all these things, but they haven't actually gotten the business working yet. So I'd much rather get the business working first and then make it pretty later versus the other way around. I think that's really wise. And I wish, I hope people hear and understand that because I'm always the same way. I'm like, get your product and service out there, see who's going to buy it from you, work out the kinks and later worry about all the flashy stuff that people usually do first. Like, Get yep. an office and making a website and getting business yeah. cards and all that shit that means absolutely nothing. <laughs> you said get an office. I I've totally done that. I've got you got an office. I got a file cabinet. I got my desk. I got all this stuff. What what do you do? I don't know. You know, <laughs> like it's. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a key. Um, I I think one of the reasons, like what we do uh, for for new prospects coming in, is we do a lot of evaluations and reviews and and I call them blind spot evaluations. But the reality is whether it's copy or your own brand or your own business image or your, your strategy, all of us are too close to our own problems. We can't, we can't give ourselves outside perspective. Mm -hmm. And so we do these evaluations and we kind of pick out all the blind spots that are costing business money. Yeah. Um, and, and we do it for free. Um, but some of those clients end up becoming clients, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I really just enjoy it. It's like I get to wake up and I get to do some evaluations during the day. Then I do a podcast interview and then I work with the client on strategy and then we help 
you know, maybe do a website. Um, and so it's like this perfect combination for me. But like I said, it just took me 15 years to get here. That's all right. You're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel the same way. It's taken me, I started as an entrepreneur when I was 16 and it's taking me over two decades to feel like I have it halfway figured out finally. <laughs> so. Well, I think the one thing I, I would say is looking back is like, I, I want to say that I've arrived, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm further, further, uh, far enough along in my journey at this point to know that there is no arrival. Yeah. It's, it's like at some point you got to realize this is a never ending journey. Your brand and your business image will always continue to evolve your skills, the ops to come, come at you, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's regulations, whatever, those are never going to end. And so once you can fall in love with the process and build a repeatable positive feedback loop for your life so that mm-hmm. I have the health, I get the workout in, I spend the family time, I've got the work time. Once you kind of get into that range, you, you start to stop trying to get somewhere else. Yeah. No, you're right. It's always, it's always just graduation to the next level. And, and there's definitely times to like enjoy and celebrate wherever you've reached. But it's, mm-hmm. if you stay there, I always tell you, if you stop growing, you'll die. Yeah. Like, that's all there is to it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's definitely key. And the other thing you said that I think is really worth pointing out and highlighting is that you lead with value first and you serve first for free there's no you know and obviously if it's a good fit and you want to work with the the, you know the client i assume that that it moves forward um but has that always been the mindset for you or is that something you had to uncover and realize like this is the right no i i would say that cash flow there there's what i call nine success factors you know it's your skills and your knowledge and your team and your relationships um but one of the nine success factors is your current state of cash flow and reserves and I, I usually say that it's kind of like a drunk monkey with Alzheimer's punching you in the side of the head as you go through the entrepreneurial journey. It's like this annoying thing that kind of tries to sidetrack you all the time. It's like it's throwing stuff at you. You're just – and so cash flow sometimes gets, gets your mind not working properly. And so there have been times I've done the classic mistakes, you know, reaching out to people in your Facebook at messenger inbox and trying to sell them five minutes after you met them. Um, I've, I've done all those little things that we all see. Um, and, and usually the issue is cash flow. And so if your reserves and your cash flow are stabilized, then you can think clearly and you'd get strategic with your business and you wouldn't make rash decisions. Yeah. And sometimes when things get out of whack, you start doing things that are, that are skipping the normal progression of, of how humans build relationships. Yeah. Um, and, and that was a huge factor for me when I was able to, I, I would describe it as I was temporarily able to suspend reality for a moment and go to value first before mm-hmm. I had reserves and cash flow and everything else built. So there's a, there's a period of time where you've got to kind of just, I think some people use drugs and alcohol for that, but it's like, you've got to kind of escape it and yeah. just say, that is what it is over there. Today, I'm going to focus on how I can give value to this person or this lead magnet or this thing. And when you get distracted because the water's going to get shut off or something like that, it, <laughs> it makes it much more difficult. Yeah. And, and so I would just say in, in, like what I would do is if you can suspend that and think properly, what would I, do? the question is, what would I do if I had 12 million bucks in the bank right now? Yeah. Because then you can at least think clearly. Mm-hmm. And it was a huge turning point for my business when I felt good about prospecting. I felt good about how I generated leads because I wasn't asking for anything. And yeah. that was, that was a huge tipping point because we started generating leads consistently because I felt good about it. Yeah. Um, and so all I do is I say, would you like a free, free evaluation? And then, and then I say, okay, here's the evaluation. If you'd like some more direct one-on-one help with me, we can hop on a sales call together. Yeah. And, and that's all I do. And so I yeah. never take a sales call unless they've said, I want some more direct help, you know? <laughs> no, that's definitely always the way to do it. And I like what you said about like suspending reality for a minute. And the way that I've thought about that too 
because I, I know what the end of the road looks like. Like I've slept in my car and like lost it all and like been through some rough stuff. So I know what the real end of the road is or close at least. And I always encourage people, if you can just list out what you're actually afraid of and what actually will happen, like if the water gets shut off, will you die? Probably yeah. not. Like you could probably, we, you could figure that out. Or like if you list out all the worst case scenario stuff, then you can say, oh, I actually do have breathing space or there's a solution for that. Or I don't need that thing that I, I've told myself I need that I don't really need to pay for anymore. A hundred percent, you know, like, and, and some, one of the things that comes to me, cause right on my website, it's like, I've spent 15 years and 200 grand. So you don't have to type of message. Right. Um, that is legitimate. It's like, I re, I'm reminded of 2006 going through a Dale Carnegie training mm -hmm. and, and one of their solutions to worry is, is basically fast forwarding, just like you said, to the worst case scenario. Yeah. Because if you realize like, if this happens, I may lose my house. If that happens, I have to get an apartment. And my wife and I did that when th times were really tough in, in 2008, 2009 for us. Mm -hmm. We just said, what's the worst thing that would happen? We'd lose all of our assets and we'd end up in an apartment. Well, yep. that actually happened for us. We didn't, we didn't lose a roof over our head. We always had food on the table. We yep. did have moments where the kitchen was bare, but, mm -hmm. um, and the fridge was like ketchup, <laughs> you know, but, but I, I think that's one trick. Tim Ferriss has a good Ted talk um, about, about looking at the worst case scenario and fear. I think it's something along the lines of fear. Um, but it's like fear setting. It's like deal with the absolute worst case scenario so that you can kind of suspend that reality and yeah. just mentally go there and realize you're not going to die. There's, there's, millions of other people that are still living off of less than a few dollars a day in the world. And, and especially if you're in the States, our lives are not that bad. No, we live, we live in incredibly affluent lives. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter where you are in the States, you have an affluent life compared to everybody else. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, definitely. And just kind of another question related to this is how do you see like financial intelligence and financial management and budgeting and financial controls, all of that, as it relates to where you are today and like how you help clients, has that been a factor or what's the shift from like being a nine to five employee and getting a paycheck every week to being an entrepreneur and you're not sure exactly how much you're going to make this week. Is there anything that you've dealt with or used, you know, tool wise on that front? Yeah, I think for me to, um, I, I really struggled in that area because in the beginning I was literally doing everything. So, and, I, and that's pretty common. Um, you know, you're not only sales, but you're running your brand and you're the, you're running your website and you're doing finance and all these things. Yeah. Especially like, like on my end, I was also growing a team at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was just too many things. And so how I think about finance and those things, like that's not my job. My, mm -hmm. my job now is to promote the brand, to help clients with strategy. And, mm -hmm. and that's really for the most part it. Um, everything else is either delegated or done by somebody else. And yeah. so finances was one of those things. It was, it's a job in and of itself. And so I was, I was screwing it up when I was doing it all on my own, plus the marketing, plus everything. And, and that's developed over time. There was, I, I get that question a lot where it's like, what was the, what was the one thing that shifted it or what was the quick fix? And there wasn't, it was like solving one problem at a time. Mm -hmm. strategically taking one thing off my plate at a time. And over time I got everything off my plate for the most part, except the things that gave me energy. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm glad you came back to that. Cause I think that's a huge key. And I think that's something that no matter what stage you're at in business, you have to sometimes like be re-reminded that or realign with like, what gives me energy? What could I do all day without it being work? And in the beginning, yeah, we like in some senses, you do have to do a lot of those jobs at some stage, but as soon as you can get them off your plate, then you're actually going to grow and succeed. And you know, the more you delegate and let go of the stuff you're not good at, the better. <laughs> yeah. And typically, um, you know, strategic coach who's been coaching entrepreneurs for, for 40 plus years now, um, they've kind of started to see all these trends and cycles in entrepreneurs, but typically they have something called uh, the ceiling of complexity which is about every 90 days, you're going to feel stuck or confused. And so like their meetings were every 90 days because it, it gave you a forced two day break from the business to plan and get strategic and kind of realign. 
Um, our, our, the highest end mastermind I'm in is, is that way. It's every 90 days. It's a five day period in a different country. So what we're doing is we're, we're stopping our traditional day-to-day patterning mm-hmm. and going to a completely new country, new environment, having a five day mastermind together, but it's a break from the business to kind of realign and make sure everything's in alignment and then develop a plan for what the next 90 days is going to look like. And so you kind of, if you can develop a habit like that, where, where every 90 days I take a five day break to get clear. And then for 85 days, I just, I go, you know, if you can kind of develop something that works for you, you'll have a lot more success and you'll, what it does is it stops the roller coaster. Um, I I still journal almost every day Mm -hmm. um, because it stopped my roller coaster. It was like, when I didn't journal and didn't take time to process my feelings and my emotions and my thoughts, I was having huge highs and huge lows. Like I would crash one week and like that entrepreneurial cycle, like I'm on top of the world. Things are, things are terrible. We're going to fall apart, you know? (laughs) Yeah. That's wise. I think, yeah, I think everything you can do to like reinforce mental stability and take those breaks and get away is what levels it out. Cause that's definitely the hardest part of entrepreneurship I think is not, not the clients, not the cash flow, not the team. It's your own head of like, am I headed in the right direction? Is this going to work? Is this the greatest thing ever or the worst thing ever? I've definitely been through those lows and highs. And it's, it's similar things that you said, like journaling and reflection and getting outside input helps you level out so you don't feel as crazy because there's days that it feels crazy. There's nothing, nothing you can do about that. <laughs> yeah, and like last night I was sitting around, I started to feel crazy. I was and it was just like, that's part of the game. So you really... I mean, I would say 99% of it has been in between your ears. Um, yeah. So you really need to have a solid mindset and clarity on what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because the rest, honestly, the, the rest is routines, structuring routines and habits and patterns and relationships in a way that support the clarity of what you're going after. Yeah. And so once you're clear, it's just habit building and routine building and, and relationship building so that everything in your life supports the thing that you're going after. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I have a friend of mine who um, is CEO of a huge company and I watched them go from like nothing to, I think they do like 10, 15 million a month or something in a matter of four years. And I heard him on an interview one time and he said, he said, I'm unwilling to sacrifice my focus for anything, but you know, what I've already laid out and I'm clear about and I mean, just the way he said that would just really hit home with me because like, cause I know him and I know what he's achieved in like four years. I mean, astronomical, yeah. you know, growth. And that really hit home with me because I think we allow ourselves to be distracted by things or we settle for things or we tolerate things that are not, you know, behaviors that a, a real CEO or a real, real leader, you know, of a huge business would tolerate because they just don't, they can't allow that in their, you know, in their, in their view. Yeah. And I think, I think uh, that's a hundred percent accurate, which is we get to this place where you realize everything in your life and in your business, you've allowed to be there. Yeah. And, and that's not only taking ownership, you've allowed these things to happen, these relationships to happen. But once you get to that place and realize that you, you literally, when you look at manifesting and how that works, it's like you have to, so many people are trying to have something and then, uh, they're trying to, they, they're, they're hoping that if I do these things and I have these things and I'll become somebody new, mm-hmm. but it's actually the reverse of that. You just have to be the person you want to uh, do these patterns and have these things. And so you have to be the person today. And the story that I, I'm reminded of is Dan Kennedy. Um, to get a hold of Dan Kennedy back in the day was, was you had to FedEx something to his assistant. She, she then sifted through what she thought Dan would want a meeting for. Then she'd send it to Dan. You'd wait two and a half weeks. He'd get back to the assistant. She'd FedEx you something back. It says, Dan will take a meeting with you. Oh. And well, most people aren't going to wait three weeks to get an answer on a meeting. Yeah. And, and, and somebody, one of his students said, well, that's easy because you're Dan Kennedy. You can do that. And he said, here's the key. I did that before anybody knew me as Dan Kennedy. And so wow. he was, he did that first to position himself as tough to get a hold of yeah. before he was even known in the marketplace. And so it's about doing those things first and yeah. then letting the marketplace catch up, catch up to you. 
That's a great story. I've heard pieces of that, but not at all together like that. Um, so that's really valuable. And yeah, you're right. You have to behave like, you know, the person that you want to be and then everything else will align with that. And yeah, it's, that's definitely, it's, it's, it's definitely internal first. <laughs> and, and if you're not there yet, like let's say, let's say the person you want to be is running a, a million dollar a month business and I want to work from home and I want to do all these things and I want to only work with relationships that give me energy and don't take away from it. The, the key is you, it's like uh, the old boiler room movie with Ben Affleck. It's like act as if you kind of have to act as if, and, and when a decision or an obstacle comes at you, you, you basically say to yourself, how would the $12 million a year business owner react to this opportunity or this obstacle or whatever? And then you make your decisions based on that future self. Yeah. And so you could say like, gosh, if I had 12 million bucks in the bank today, is this relationship make me feel good or not? And you just make quick decisions. Yeah. And so that's, you hear all these buzzwords like, oh, the greatest leaders in the world or the greatest generals in the world, they make quick decisions. That's just because they have tremendous clarity. Yeah. They've preset a filter that allows them to make good choices. <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Awesome, Mike. Well, uh, this has been really, really valuable. I appreciate you sharing this with all of us. And uh, where can everybody find you and connect with you? And what, 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 uh, where can they find out more about what you do? Yeah, yeah, Gabe. Uh, TheMakeoverMaster.com is our website. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if anybody wants a, a free evaluation of their social media and their website, they can, they can find that on our site. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on, Mike. We'll definitely have you back soon, all right? been listening to today's business leaders with Gabe Arnold. Remember to subscribe on iTunes. For more information, visit todaysbusinessleaders.com. Yeah.